This uh, regular city council meeting is called to order. It is March 1st, 2021. It is seven o'clock on the nose. Um, city Clerk Ed Norris, would you call the roll? Mayor McClellan? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Burns? Yes. Council Member Radner? Yes. Council Member Edgar? Here. Council Member Whitehead? Here. Okay, we have a quorum. Everyone is here. Please note, um, find uh, item 14 on your agenda. Add item E, which is a uh, Ferndale purchase agreement for uh, a park so that the, um, the new school can be built. We discussed that earlier, and this is <coughs> the final, um, putting the final touches on that. 14E. <coughs> is there a motion to approve the agenda as amended? So moved. Second. Second. Mm, thank you. So that Burns and Edgar. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Consent agenda. <coughs> um, I had the most fun reading the um, the minutes uh, of the uh, the different commissions. I found out that uh, congratulations are due to Avi Snyder on his wedding and to director Crystal Van Vliet and her uh, expected baby, and to Terry McQueen for putting out her first record. All that from the consent agenda. So these are root items presented for city council approval without discussion. They include regular city council meeting minutes of February 15th, 2021, special council minutes of the same date, arts and cultural diversity commission meeting minutes of December 10th, and January 14th, Beautification Advisory Commission meeting minutes of June 16th, 2020, Corridor Improvement Authority meeting minutes of December 17th, 2020, Recycling Commission meeting February 20th, 2020, Licenses New and Renewals submitted for March 1st, 2021. Uh, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Thank Second. You. Uh, Burns and second by Redner, is that? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Um, I understand we have um, Oakland County Commissioner Charlie Cavell. We are on the recognition of visiting elected officials. Welcome to Oak Park. Hi, Mayor. Hi, Council. Hi, everyone. Uh, may I say a couple things, or is now the time? You feel free to give complete support at this time. Thank you. Yeah, so hi, everybody. I'm our county commissioner for the 18th district. Uh, I want to just give a quick COVID update for everyone, and then a couple of resources that are helpful for COVID and also just Oakland County government in general because Oakland County government does much more than just COVID response. Um, so first, I'll give you a couple of good pieces of news and then some data points about COVID. So the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is a single shot dose, should be coming to Oakland County government in the next couple of days for us to then begin distributing uh, soon thereafter. So this is a really big turning point. This is really exciting um, because as you're gonna hear when I talk about all the data points, We've gotten X number of shots, but then you have to double that to understand or to get to the full number of people that have been fully inoculated or vaccinated fully for the COVID vaccine. But that's not the case with the Johnson & Johnson because it's a one-shot dose. Second thing I wanna say is that Oakland County government has recently expanded its vaccination sites from five to 15 so that uh, the vaccine can be closer and more accessible and more within reach for everybody here in Oakland County. And there's been particular attention paid to south of 12th Mile. So that should be good for all of us here in Oak Park. Uh, so to give you some data, Michigan has received 2.9 million doses of COVID vaccine. Oakland County, which has systems that are OakGov and private hospital systems like Beaumont, Ascension, McLaren, Henry Ford, and St. Joe's. But both of those together, Oakland County has received 322,000 
doses of vaccine to date. OGov itself has received 81,295 doses of vaccine to date. And then this week, Oakland County government has received 20,780 doses. And this is a big deal because just six, seven weeks ago, we were receiving less than 2,000 doses a week. So this ramp up is very serious and we're really starting to turn the corner on this in terms of the vaccine supply. Um, so those are some COVID updates for everybody. If I could give them some helpful information, uh, please go to oaklandcountyvaccine.com if you wanna sign up to save your spot, if you wanna learn more about how you can register with your health system, or if you wanna learn about how you can get registered for uh, Myers vaccine, oaklandcountyvaccine.com. Also call the nurse on call if you have questions or would like to set up a vaccine appointment. And if you know anyone who, or you yourself don't have internet access, uh, please call 800-848-5533. That's the nurse on call at 800 Eight four eight five five three three, and I know it's an eight hundred number, but a real live nurse will pick up the phone when you call, and the wait time is usually only thirty seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the last thing is, you can call me anytime at two four eight eight zero seven four three four seven. Also, you can text at two four eight eight zero seven four three four seven, and that's good for COVID or anything related to the county. Or if you just have a question about your government and don't want to you know, pester the mayor and council because you know they're working hard for you, you can start with me. <laughs> okay, that was what I had for today. Wonderful. Thank you, Commissioner. That <clears throat> um, a very accessible and, and lots of good reporting. Um, lots of reports are sent to me that um, are daily updates. So uh, communication is very good with Oakland County, uh, with our new commissioners. Um, we also have for item six, uh, special recognition and presentations. 6A is nine mile redesign update and patronicity campaign presentation. Um, City Manager Tungate, who would you like to uh, do this? Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of council. I'd like to ask Director Kimberly Maroney um, to take this one, please. Um, thank you, Eric. Actually, I'm going to turn it right over to Crystal. She's going to begin the presentation. Thank you. All right. Good evening. I'm going to share my screen, so bear with me for one moment. Okay. Um, good evening, Mayor, Council, City Manager. Tonight, we're going to give you and anyone listening an update on the transformation of the Nine Mile Corridor including what we've completed so far, and then also a preview of the plans for the next phase, including an incredible fundraising opportunity that we have um, at our fingertips to help fund this project. All right, so many of you probably remember the Nine Mile Redesign Conception um, began in 2015 when the Congress for New Urbanism, um, and we actually had them in um, paid by a grant, they came in and worked with the city to engage the public and develop a conceptual plan to transform the corridor into a vibrant pedestrian oriented street. From there, the city hired an engineering firm and through the years of continued engagement with the public and improving upon the original conceptual design, we began implementing the transformation. In 2019, in partnership with the city of Ferndale and with the assistance of roughly $1.3 million in grant funds, we completed phase one of the redesign. It entailed a road restructuring or also known as a road diet where we took um, Nine Mile Road east of Coolidge into the Ferndale border from four to five lanes in some areas down to three. So one direction or one lane of traffic in each direction in a left-hand turn lane, which provided us more room um, for dedicated bike lanes, increased commercial parking, increased and improved pedestrian crossings, updated amenities on the Nine Mile Corridor, including one of the city's five MOGO bike share stations, consistent durable fencing along Nine Mile, other beautification updates, and <clears throat> several new public spaces, including the trailhead, which contains a bike repair station and seating, the Nine Mile Seneca Pocket Park, which um, includes our DNA tower and seating for residents, as well as updated lighting, and then our Sherman Pocket Park, um, which includes cornhole, seating for residents, 
um, and visitors, and also um, a very large chess set. So the city kicked off phase one in October of 2019. Um, luckily, before the cold weather set in and before the onslaught of the pandemic, we were able to, to celebrate the progress that we were making and highlight many of the new amenities from phase one. We received a lot of wonderful feedback and we're excited to continue that momentum and continue implementing the transformation of the nine mile corridor. <clears throat> the city is now focusing its efforts on phase two of this project, which includes the nine mile linear park and the connector park, as well as the completion of the fencing on nine mile road. Um, the conception and design of these two new connected public parks has been informed by a significant amount of public input over the years, including open houses and even visits to the schools to ask students what they would like to see. Largely influenced by that input, we have developed a clear and comprehensive vision of these new public spaces. I'm now going to turn it over to our Recreation Director, Lori Stasiak, to discuss the plans for both the Linear Park and the Connector Park. And then following Lori's overview, Economic Development and Planning Director, Kim Maroney, will present one of the exciting grant funding opportunities that we have available to us to help us fund this next phase. <clears throat> but before I do that, I'd like to take a quick moment to let the public know that at tonight's special council meeting earlier today, um, City Council created the Nine Mile Public Art Ad Hoc Committee. Um, Lori will be speaking in a minute with you about the elements of the linear park, but one of those is a public art installation along the entire stretch of the linear park. <clears throat> the city will be soliciting requests for proposals for this installation, and the purpose of the temporary committee is to review those proposals and ultimately make a recommendation to council on which proposal is best suited for the linear park. Council is seeking two residents to sit on this temporary committee who have a working knowledge of public art and or experience in various art forms and who are interested in assisting the city in choosing the next, or I'm sorry, the first public art installation. The application, which is due March 25th, so the end of this month, will be available on the city's website this week. It will also be shared on our social media channels. <clears throat> excuse me. But you may also contact me for a copy of the application. Um, my phone number and my email address are right here. Um, if you would like it. So it'll be a fillable application that can be either dropped off at City Hall at our drop boxes or um, emailed to myself. So with that, I will now turn it over to our Recreation Director, Lori Stasiak, who will give you an overview of the Connector Park and Linear Park. Uh, thank you, Crystal. And good evening, Mayor, City Council members, and City Manager Tungate. I'm so glad to be here tonight to share the amenities we are planning for the Linear and Connector Parks. As a quick reminder, the amenities were chosen by, based on community input and what Oak Park residents said they would like to see in the linear and connector parks and what they would like most likely to use. I'm um, going to take you through several slides to show you each of the amenities and where they will sit along the linear park. We want you to be able to visualize the dream of the park and what it will look like. Please keep in mind that these are conceptual slides. They do not give the details of the neighborhood, such as the houses to the south or the businesses on the north side of Nine Mile. There are a number of slides, so please bear with me as I go through them. I think it would be really give, really give you a good sense of what the whole park will look like and what will be available for residents to enjoy. We designed the park to have a number of options of both playful and passive elements in the nodes, along with providing something for all ages, abilities, and interests. Unfortunately, what you won't see on these slides are uh, some of the specific spots for the public art. These uh, are still being decided and will uh, come out later. I will share this information in three parts. The first, the amenities of the Linear Park from Scotia to Manistee. The second, from Manistee to Rosewood. And the third part, the Connector Park between Troy and Nine Mile. There are, okay, next slide. <laughs> there are several benches for sitting, bench swings with shade covering, and picnic tables throughout the parks. On the first slide, it starts out with uh, one of our benches and a garbage can, and those lead up to the sensory panels, which provide a variety of games, puzzles, and stationary learning activities for, all, for a variety of all ages, and they are ADA accessible. 
it what it makes what learning fun. The next section is our rocking zone, which includes what's called a free ride. It's a seesaw or a rocker lounger, ideal for building strength and coordination. Uh, what is small in this diagram is a number nine rocker. It's uniquely shaped like the number nine for nine mile. On the next slide, you'll see two bench swings designed to provide shade overhead. And uh, there is a possible spot in the middle for upcoming public art. On the next slide are benches and garbage cans. And then you come up on the next slide to our lolly tops. They identify the crosswalks. They provide shade and visual interest in assorted colors for a fun new look, both colorful and whimsical. Next to that is our Yelp. It is an internet, interactive game arch that works intuitively. If you walk under the arch, it immediately asks you if you wanna play a game. Different games can be selected at the touch of a button. All ages, all abilities, adults and seniors will enjoy it. The next slide you see is our spin zone. Spinning helps to improve balance, muscle control and gross motor skills. The cone spinner you see there combines the excitement of spinning with the challenge of climbing all in one. The two other um, elements there are the eddies, eddies 0.2 and eddies 0.5 spinners. You can use it alone or with a friend. The eddy 0.5 has a longer stem for adults to play on. And those blank spots you see are placements for picnic tables. And the next slide, this is a close up of our challenge course. And over the next couple of slides, you will see the whole course. The challenge course is for the kids will race and jump on and explore where and how to get to the other side. It promotes speed, agility, upper body strength, and it challenges motor planning skills. The different shapes give visual appeal and interest and has unique climbing elements on it. The next group of slides uh, start with the other section of the linear park from Manistee to Rosewood. Um, this is where our mogul station is. Uh, it doesn't depict the mogul station uh, exactly, uh, but um, it gives a, a good picture of what it might look like. Uh, the next slide is a bench swing, and that comes up to our play cubes on the next slide. They provide accessible climbing with different levels of challenge. Kids can explore on and through the cubes. Also in this picture is a great example of some of the ideas for landscaping that will be dispersed throughout the park. The next slide is our freestanding musical instruments. It lets children of all abilities experience the joy and benefits of making music. It promotes interactive play, encourages all abilities, all ages, it's multi-generational, and there are, there are no wrong notes here. Next are the lolly tops to identify the crosswalk there. And you will see in the next slide, the balance course, which helps develop a sense of balance, coordination, and motor skills. Uh, the different sections, one of the sections is the sidewalk section. It's based on the user's weight. Uh, the curved beam develops balance and coordination. The steppers or stepping stones create challenging paths of differing, differing step heights. And the bounce buttons, spring-loaded for uh, balancing fun, they range in motion and that is determined by the user's weight. Our next slide is the bike challenge course. Riders of all, <clears throat> excuse me, riders of all abilities can challenge themselves on the rolling elevated surfaces. Uh, the inset, inset uh, picture shows a better picture of what the actual uh, part of uh, this particular section will look like. And another bench swing in the distance and spots for picnic tables. And lastly, 
uh, a small rocking zone. There are two beetles there. One beetle moves quickly to the right and left and the other beetle rocks back and forth. Then the next few slides uh, show the various views of the connector park. As a reminder, the connector park joins with the linear trail from Troy Street and is about 1.2 of an acre. This space is currently a vacant green space, allows for a safe connection for the adjacent neighborhood to the planned linear park, including a variety of inclusive activities and features to encourage cooperative uh, social time for children and families of all abilities. As you can see from the picture, there are a number of planned amenities that include a 10 foot wide multi-use pathway, LED pedestrian scale lighting, a shaded seated area with an accessible table, several benches, several play amenities that may be utilized by children with mobility devices, a Zoom zip line that can take kids from one end of the park to the other. And we're gonna take a closer look at some of these, the Zoom tracks or zip line. It's suspended along an overhead rail with a launch pad at either end. Kids can push off to propel themselves down the rail and kids can soar from one end to the other. The other is the lolly tops and sensory panels. The lolly tops provide shade and visual interest while the sensory panels provide a variety of games, puzzles, and stationary learning activities. Next is the U-Bounce. Um, this is up to three kids can use it at a time. You can bounce seated or standing. It's accessible and ADA compliant. And lastly is the Accessible World. It sits flush to the ground accommodates up to two wheelchair users with an additional space for small kids, for, for more kids and an added seat for a caregiver. So I hope this gives you a better idea of what the parks will look like in the very near future. Thank you. Thank you, Director Stasiak. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members and City Manager Tungate. Uh, Director Stasiak just outlined for us the planned amazing new park space and Director Van Vleck mentioned the desire to add the public art as well. In order to fully realize all the elements, we have decided to partner with Patronicity and the MEDC to raise the additional uh, money um, of $100,000 to make this a reality. The video will explain the program and we hope you will donate into it. We have already received many donations as more information is available on our website and will be posted on our social media pages. Benny, if you could run the video for us, please. Hi, I'm Kim Maroney and I'm the Economic Development and Planning Director for the City of Oak Park. The Nine Mile Redesign Project Implementation as a whole began back in 2015 to redesign Nine Mile Road. We gather public input to help redesign it and make it more attractive to our residents, businesses, and investors. The first phase included a road diet, increased parking, enhanced pedestrian crossings, bike lanes, and the creation of two new parks as seen here. These changes have begun the transformation of the nine mile corridor into a vibrant pedestrian and bicycle friendly environment that will attract people and businesses. The next phase of the project is to create a linear park and connector park along the Nine Mile Corridor that will include a lot of great amenities for people of all ages and for the first time ever, public art installations. As a resident, I'm excited to see the new additions to the linear park and how they will greatly improve our already wonderful city. We love the linear parks. The park is designed to serve residents throughout the city, but specifically, as an important amenity in the southern part of the Oak Park where more neighborhood park spaces is needed. By having additional neighborhood park space, it will encourage residents to get out more, exercise, and interact with each other. It will also increase visibility and business of our local establishments as more people utilize the park. This linear park will keep the integrity of an open, natural green space. We will have bioswales to assist with stormwater management 
and areas that will be landscaped with flowers and bushes to create a unique outdoor experience in the heart of our city. Our path will be wide enough for wheelchair users to pass and transfer onto the equipment. There are rocking swings for young and old, a spin zone activity, a sensory panel that promotes fine motor skills, along with hand-eye coordination, a youth challenge course that promotes speed, agility, strength, and balance, picnic tables to sit at and eat at, and benches to sit and watch your children play or just to sit and rest. These types of spaces can be an important catalyst for cultural connections, events, and places for gathering and kids to play. It beautifies the city. It, it, it makes it more attractive to young families having these parks, um, you know, places for right on their street maybe. The city has been lucky to secure a lot of outside funding for the first phase of this project and we continue to search for grant and funding opportunities to fully fund this next phase. Patronicity is a grant funding platform specifically designed for improving the places we live. Wouldn't it be great if we could put play equipment in that park on Nine Mile Road uh, so that kids can come and be attracted to play there and adults can come and maybe read a book there. I would just love to see that happen and to have that happen, we need to ask you to open your hearts and help us out uh, with a donation. It's a patronicity donation. Um, and we'd, we'd love to make this up and coming park just blossom for the spring and the summer so that we can play there when we're back outside. Um, it would mean a lot to all the residents of Oak Park. Our campaign is supported by the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, which means for every dollar we raise, the MEDC will match it up to $50,000. In other words, if we raise $50,000 for this campaign, that money will double to $100,000. This is where we need your help to fulfill the vision the community has for Nine Mile to be a vibrant corridor by donating today to our campaign. It was a wonderful. My apologies for the glitch on the video, but that concludes our presentation for tonight. We're Thank open to any questions you might have. Um, and Director Van Vleck, um, Director Stasiak, that was amazing. And it's been a dream, I think, uh, to change a nine mile from kind of a rundown spot where nothing's there into this. Um, vibrant community gathering spot. I'm excited. Um, for number 6B, uh, we would like to introduce Joy Wells, who is new director of the SOAR Chamber of Commerce. Um, director Wells, would you like to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your vision? Yes, hi, good evening. Um, evening, Mayor and Council, City Manager Tungate. Uh, my apologies, I'm still on the road. Um, so turning on a camera isn't a, a good option right now. Um, I assure you though, I'm not driving. <laughs> um, I'm very excited to be here and even more excited to announce the new chamber namesake, the South Oakland Area Regional Chamber of Commerce, which is made up of three neighboring cities, Highland Park, Hazel Park, Oak Park, and Ferndale. And the description of our physical geography creates an acronym that we think is a fitting adjective for what we expect to do in 2021 and beyond, SOAR. This newly formed chamber is an exciting extension for all of the affiliate communities, presenting new opportunities, not only for our small business communities, but for larger businesses and regional industry leaders. The strength of this powerful chamber also lends itself to a positive residential impact within all involved communities as well. Our executive board is comprised of Josh Champagne of Incubizo, serving as board chairman, Blake Shear of Level One Bank, serving as treasurer, and Mia Peroni of Quick Checkbooks, serving as secretary. 
And this new board of directors encompasses four veteran board members and nine new board members. Each of the three communities included in this new chamber have equal representation. And we are also the first Oakland County Chamber to include an Oakland County Economic Development Team member at this time being served by Annika Norris. This will be a pilot year for us with lots of learning and many growth opportunities. We are currently working on programming events and membership engagement, just to name a few. It is important to note that the programming that we are assembling is being very carefully crafted so it is relevant for all. The small business communities and the industry leaders in our region will find programming specifically addressing their unique business concerns, whether that is networking or advocacy or a myriad of possibilities in between. We recognize that chamber benefits and services are not a one size fits all conversation. We have resumed our monthly coffee connections as we want our members to stay aware of these new and exciting changes. And we also want the communities involved in the new program discussions this is, after all, their chamber too. The coffee connections are currently being held twice monthly and virtually. We are utilizing a new platform that allows for one-on-one -on -one conversations and we are excited to offer such while we continue navigating through virtual meeting space. We feel like this platform brings back a portion of human connection that has been missed throughout the pandemic. The next is scheduled for Tuesday, March 9th at 9 a.m. And anyone interested in attending can email myself, joy at ferndalechamber.com to receive the necessary registration information. And these are open for all to attend regardless of chamber member status. In closing, we have launched, launched a landing page for our new website, www.southoaklandarearegionalcc.org and I anticipate completion of our website before the end of March. Until then, everyone is encouraged to stay informed of our progress, upcoming events, and ways to meet the new board through our newsletter, website, and social media. And anyone who would like to be added to the newsletter can also email joy at ferndalechamber.com and I would be happy to accommodate. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation and we're looking forward to that coffee connection. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we are down on our agenda to number 11 bids. 11A is a request to award the bid for the 2021 Sidewalk Repair Program, M713, to Georgie Concrete in the amount of $650,873 and to temporarily transfer $150,873 from the general fund balance for this expenditure. Um, is there a motion to award this bid? So moved. Okay, and it's um, Radner, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Burns, thank you. Um, discussion or questions? Um, I would guess that is uh, Assistant City Manager Yee, would you discuss this? I have a question. Yes. Okay, the sidewalk program, is this a new company that we are dealing with now for our sidewalk repair program? And why, why did we have to transfer almost $151,000 from the general fund budget? Okay, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, members of city council, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, this company we have worked with in the past. They did not do the program um, uh, the last time we did it, but we do a sidewalk program um, biannually or every other year. And um, I think it's very critical for us to do a sidewalk program. Um, we have a very pedestrian friendly community and um, I feel it's important to um, do a sidewalk program. And, you know, before the new new laws um, on the open and obvious for trip hazards, it used to really protect us in lawsuits um, when we when we had an active sidewalk program. But I still think it's important, and it was you know something that we've talked about with uh, the members of city council last year's budget session that we were going to be doing a sidewalk program um, for the sake of our uh, pedestrian um, community. So. Um, that was question number one. Question number two is why was it so much over budget? So 
when we were comparing the size of this year's project um, compared to uh, the previous, uh, the previous um, sidewalk project, we didn't take into account um, some of the larger like commercial type of areas and lots that um, kind of affected the amount of sidewalk. So this area has a lot more sidewalk than the previous program. And um, we just kind of took it on a geographical area and not on the, so to speak, miles of sidewalk. So uh, we did have more sidewalk than we expected, but um, you know, the bids actually came in fairly competitive, a four inch uh, uh, sidewalk square is about $130 and a six inch, uh, which is your normal area, but the areas in the driveway and the drive approaches, we make them a little thicker because the cars drive on them and that's six inches of concrete and those are about $156. So the price per you know, square of sidewalk is, I feel reasonable. Um, now the reason we would have to, uh, or the, one of the, the, uh, the situation with transferring money over is the money is, uh, billed out to the properties. So it is money that we would temporarily move out of the fund balance. And then we would deposit back once we collected, um, those funds. Okay. Well, thank you. I was not questioning the validity of the sidewalk repair program, because I know since I've been on council, we've had them. My question, because my, I was questioning it, questioning it because the last few years, we've had problems with the contractors that we utilize for the sidewalk jobs. We've had complaints. That's why I was questioning, was this organization, GRG Concrete, one of the companies that we've utilized within the last six years or so? That was, that was my first question, not the validity of the program. I'm aware of those okay. and why we have them. Right. Yeah, th this contractor, we, we use them, I'm going to say it was probably about six years ago. And um, we definitely felt that they were a, a high quality product. They, they did a, a nice job and we didn't have nearly as many complaints when they were doing the work. Okay, so we budgeted out what, 500000 for this? Correct. It's actually coming out to 650000 because there's more sidewalk space? Correct. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further questions? Okay, are we, uh, if we're ready to vote, uh, City Clerk, the roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tem Burns. Yes. Council Member Edgar. Yes. Mayor McClellan. Yes. Council Member Radner. Yes. And Council Member Whitehead. Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Thank you. Item 11B, uh, the ceiling pool repair. Um, is this Assistant City Manager E or is this? Yes. I'll take, I'll take this one as well then. Um, at the January 4th regular meeting of the Oak Park City Council, the request to bid the 2021 swimming pool repair project was approved. Pro project was advertised and 17 contractors viewed the contract documents. On February 15th, one bid re was received and opened. The low bidder, Advanced Pool Services of Milford, Michigan, submitted a bid of $151,500. Um, References were checked and all had positive responses. Um, there is $110,000 budgeted in the general fund uh, for this expenditure. So it is recommended that the request to award the bid for the 2021 swimming pool repair project to advance pool services in the amount of $151,500 be approved. It is further recommended that $41,500 be transferred from the general fund balance for this expenditure. Okay. Um, question would be, um, why is it more than expected? I guess. So, I, you know, I can, I can answer that from personal experience and from this experience as well. Um, I also am, a, a, I run a pool club, a, a local um, pool club for our neighborhood. And um, it's, it's a very difficult time, especially and particularly right now with COVID, um, the amount of people doing uh, building pools, building new pools and doing repair to pools um, has been pretty staggering. And the, you know, the fact that we only had one bidder kind of shows you the market that's out there. Um, people are just swamped and they're not bidding on project. And when they are, the prices are high right now. Um, mm -hmm. This is something we absolutely need to do. And in particular with the pool being closed last year, I don't think the price is completely out of line to be honest with you. I think we may have under budgeted the project in general, um, but it is something that we absolutely need to do if we're gonna open the pool. 
I have a question. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Byrne. Well, well, maybe not a question, a request. Um, each year, if memory serves me correctly, we spend over $150,000, $200,000 repairing the pool every other year, if not every year. So initially I inquired about just getting a brand new pool. And I'm just curious as to how much we've spent in repairs and maintenance over the last seven years. So I can compare to the cost of a new pool. I definitely don't have the cumulative amount with me here tonight, but I can tell you this is the largest repair that we've done in, in several years. And uh, Director Stasek may be able to expand on that more, but we were, we've been talking about doing this for years. We put band-aids on it for a very long time. And I think I want to say the most we've probably spent doing these types of repairs is 20,000 maybe. Correct. And, yeah, and that was in 2017. You said these so, type of repairs, but what about the maintenance and the upkeep? Because I'm pretty sure we spent more than $20,000 per year on the maintenance and the upkeep of the pool. Well, absolutely. Just, just opening a pool and maintaining it is, is quite pricey. It just is by its nature. Um, but as far as extensive repairs go and things that have gone out to bid, um, this is one of the, you know, one of the largest, this is probably actually the largest repair um, since we built the pool or rebuilt the pool. So when you talk about um, the cost of a new pool, um, I can tell you when I, uh, well, geez, it's probably been 20 years ago since we redid that pool or, or longer and it was a million dollars. Um, so redoing a pool is uh, of that size and magnitude is, is very expensive. Um, and that was dollars from 20 years ago. I'm sure today's dollars, it would be probably a million and a half to redo that pool in its entirety. Um, so, you know, it, it's just something that uh, when you have a pool, you have to maintain it. And especially in this climate where it goes through, you know, free saw cycles every winter. And it, it just um, kind of the nature of having and maintaining a pool. But um, this is definitely overdue, I think, and it is needed to replaster this pool. Like I said, we've been putting band-aids on it for a long time. It's really needed it for probably the past, you know, five, six years anyway. Okay, can you just do me a favor and just let me know how much we spent on repairs and maintenance of the pool, let's say the last seven years? I'm just curious. I mean, I know you don't have that in front of you now. and Correct. But, you know. No, I can, I can report back, definitely. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, further questions? Um, uh, so we, uh, we need a motion to award the bid for the pool repair project to advance pool services. So moved. Thank you, that's um, uh, Council Member Edgar, is there a second? Second. Okay. Thank you. Um, Council Member Radner, are there further questions? Um, I know that providing a pool is not a, uh, a break-even event. It is, uh, uh, it's a service to the community. It's not a money maker and it's not even, we can't charge enough to break even for the uh, repairs and maintenance. But uh, people love the pool and they come together at the pool. So um, I remember asking about this as well, about the cost of the pool. Um, it, is, uh, it is a service to the residents. Uh, any, any other comments or questions? A roll call, please. Council Member Edgar? Yes. Mayor McClellan. Yes. Council Member Radner. Yes. Council Member Whitehead. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Burns. Yes. Okay. Um, motion carries. Thank you. Uh, we're now at section 14, uh, the city manager section. City manager Eric Tungate. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of council. I'm actually going to take 14A. Um, and Crystal, if you could share your screen, that would be great. Look at that. Great job. There we go. 
Um, this is a slideshow, council members, that I did not want to have to put together, but unfortunately, um, the situation uh, forced us to. So, as you know, right now, we are slated to uh, reopen to the public this week. Um, tonight, I'm asking your permission to continue our closure to the public in certain buildings uh, all the way until April 14th. And if you could go to the next. Primarily because the vaccine rollout hasn't been implemented as efficiently as hoped. Um, and staff outside of public safety have not been vaccinated yet. Um, and there are also very strict guidelines from MIOSHA in terms of the, the uh, guidelines, um, which go all the way through April 14th. Right now, uh, council members, the Open Meetings Act, I believe, allows us to continue with remote virtual meetings through March 31st. Um, I think it's safe to say that they'll probably extend that. Um, but in any event, as I've mentioned before, if we come back uh, to in-person council meetings, I would imagine there'll be a uh, feature where some will be able to have it in person and some won't. And if that happens, then of course we, had, we now have the technology to be able to host it that way. Um, next slide, please. So during the time that we've been closed to the public, um, for the most part, we've been operating pretty well. Um, it's not been easy, um, but we've definitely made the transition. Um, our you know, calls are being answered, emails are being answered. Um, we still allow for the payment options in terms of online payments and of course the Dropbox. And um, you know, we're, we're ramping up these efforts as well. So we're trying to increase our messaging in terms of how to do business with the city. And of course, with the situation we just had with the US Postal Service, um, we are in some cases addressing the issue with late water bill fees that would be associated with late payments um, due in part, as we've heard, the people were receiving their water bill after it was already due. Um, and that's, out, that's a circumstance out of our control. Next slide, please. So I am, well, I'm asking to re, I'm sorry, I'm asking to reassess at the April 5th council meeting, which would be the first council meeting in April. So to continue the closure up until that time. Are there any questions? I have a question about the late water bill fees. Mm -hmm. um, have we uh, done something about that to help the residents when they get yes. after it's due? What have we done? We are waiving those fees and on a case by case basis. It's important to remember not everybody um, had the same circumstance. So to just wave it across the board if there's a late fee wouldn't be appropriate. But for those people who are contacting our department, we are working with them to waive those fees. Because um, again, the bills that everyone knows, I think the post office is in a backlog right now with everything that's gone on. And from what I understand, I, I know we had Director Crawford here too, but from what I understand, the, we believe that most of those late mailings occurred in one quarterly bill cycle. So we've sort of sequestered it to that one bill cycle and we think we're now on the right footing and that won't happen again. That is correct. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? And if, and if not council members, I, I would appreciate a, a resolution allowing us to continue this, this closure. Okay. Um, we need a uh, motion to continue the closure until April 14th. Oh, and I have to throw a teaser out too, by the way. The teaser yeah. is that we will have some news to share with the community coming up here about vaccinations. Um, stay tuned. Good news. Everyone else does teasers. I might as well do them too, right? <laughs> yes. Um, uh, would you recommend that if somebody got their bill late that they contact the water department? Correct. Um, yep. We are looking for a motion to continue um, uh, to handle business remotely when possible until April 14th. So moved. Thank you. That's Burns. Thank you. Is there a second? 
Can't hear you. Is that Radner? I, I can't hear you, Madam Mayor. Oh. Is it just me? Yeah. Oh. I'm muted. Mayor, I think you're you're maybe you're not close enough to the mic or something because I'm having trouble hearing you as well. So did we get a second? Second. I'll second. second. Thank you. Um, Whitehead. Um, any further discussion on meeting remotely? Continuing this until every, we are continuing this until all of our staff is safely immunized. We, we treasure the people that work for us and we treasure the residents. And we don't want to spread COVID um, uh, by, by opening too soon. We would rather on the side of uh, caution. Um, so I am supporting this 100%. And um, do we need a roll call vote? No, just all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Be opposed. Motion carried unanimously. Thank you. This Thank is you, council members. Um, I, 14B, uh, Director Steve Cooper is with us this evening. Take it away, sir. Uh, good evening, Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem Council, City Manager Tungay. Uh, before the uh, City Council, I have traffic control order number 160, section uh, 1.27. At the November 10th City Council meeting in 2020, I presented temporary traffic control order number 160, section 1.25 to council. The traffic control order was adopted, making the intersection of Roanoke and Kenwood an always stop for 90 days. After 90 days, the matter would be reevaluated. As I stated previously at the November meeting, public safety had received continuous complaints dating back as far as December of 2014 regarding speeding motorists traveling northbound and southbound on Roanoke streets between Oak Park Boulevard and Nine Mile. Residents have also complained about vehicle accidents and near accidents at this intersection. Uh, there was an initial traffic study which was conducted by the Traffic Improvement Association, TIA. The recommendation was to post stop control for east and westbound Kenwood and to remove stop control for north and southbound Roanoke, allowing the traffic for north and southbound Roanoke to flow unimpeded. This recommendation was adopted by City Council at the December 1st, 2014 City Council meeting. Since the adoption of the order in 2014, public safety continued to receive the same complaints on a regular basis. The Traffic Improvement Association conducted a second speed study at that location several months later and concluded the traffic conditions did not warrant changing the signage. Public safety continued with various selective enforcement details at this location to address the problem with the, claim, the complaints persisting from residents. Just prior to the temporary traffic control order on November 10th, 2020, TIA conducted another speed study on Roanoke Street between Oak Park Boulevard and Nine Mile Road per my request. In January of 2021, I had TIA conduct a follow-up study after the always stop had been put in place for comparison purposes. The before study of Roanoke between Kenwood and Nine Mile Road indicated average speeds to be 26 miles per hour. And after the study, it indicated a decrease uh, in speeds of, uh, to reflect 23 miles per hour. So the 85th percentile speed uh, before was 29 miles per hour and the after uh, speed was 27 miles per hour. The before study of Roanoke between Oak Park Boulevard and Kenwood indicated average speeds to be 25 miles per hour and the after study indicated a decrease in speeds to reflect 23 miles per hour with the 85th percentile speeds uh, before being 29 miles per hour and after being 28 miles per hour. I personally spoke with the traffic engineer from TIA who stated he was not convinced that the reduction in speeds were a re uh, direct result of the signage change. He believes the 90 day sampling does not accurately reflect the driving behavior long term and the speeds of the drivers would possibly uh, start to rise the longer you leave the always stop in place. His recommendation is to remove the temporary always stop at Kenwood and Roanoke intersection and return 
the stop control for east and westbound Kenwood only. Uh, having dealt with this issue for the past six years, I respectfully disagree with his recommendation. At this point, I'm convinced that the change in the signage making Roanoke Street between Nine Mile Road and Oak Park Boulevard and always stop has affected the speeds of the motorists. I believe this is supported by the information contained in the summary of speed data listed in TIA's report, indicating a decrease in vehicle speeds after the always stop was put in place. I'm coming before city council this evening, uh, asking for your approval of traffic control order number 160 section 1.27, making the intersection of Roanoke and Kenwood a permanent always stop. And in the future, I'm more than happy to have TIA periodically uh, perform speed studies and analyze crash data of this intersection to see if speeds and or accidents have increased. Um, is there a motion to approve this traffic controller? So moved. Second. Radner and second was who? Burns. Burns, thank you. Um, any discussion or questions? I know that uh, it's been clear that people have complained to me about for years and years. Uh, and I know that on my corner, um, it is safer. There were two awful accidents on that corner. Uh, it's been pretty quiet, so it's been effective. Um, uh, we have a motion, we have a second. And so any further discussion? Well, I don't have any questions, but um, I would just like it to be known that I am going to agree with Director Steve Cooper because I value his opinion. And if he says he disagrees with the results of the study, then I will support him. So I will go with yes. He knows this area better than anyone and he's very familiar with that location. So I adhere to his um, response and his opinion. Sounds good. Any further comment? Um, okay, a roll call, please. Mayor McClellan. Yes. Mayor McClellan? Yes. Uh, Councilmember Radner? Yes. Councilmember Whitehead? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Burns? Yes. Council Member Edgar? Yes. Unanimously approved. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Cooper. Great job. Uh, okay, 14C, Director Kimberly Maroney, please. Thank you, Eric. Good evening again. The City of Oak Park Economic Development and Planning Department has applied for and received grant funding through the Oakland County Restaurant Relief Program. There were two phases of the program. Phase one included the purchase of weatherization items to help support our local restaurants to create outdoor dining spaces, and we received that in the amount of $8,502. In phase two, it included a combination of items purchased in the amount of $17,110 and also reimbursement in the amount of $43,567, um, which will be made available to our local restaurants in support of their weatherization efforts with a maximum award of $10,000 per business. The products purchased will be owned by the City of Oak Park and leased for a dollar to businesses in need. The department has reached out to all restaurants in Oak Park, both by numerous emails and phone calls. An application was developed and sent to all uh, to complete and be considered for reimbursement. And that was mailed just this week to all of our restaurants as well. Um, we are asking um, that city council approve city manager, Eric Tungate to sign the restaurant relief program in a local agreement with Oakland County. And the agreement has been reviewed and approved by our city attorneys. Um, <clears throat> let's get a motion to approve the interlocal agreement. First, and then find that question. So moved. Thank you. Uh, Council Member. Uh, Edgar? Radner. Radner, thank you. Discussion or questions? Oh. I'm, I'm delighted that we're doing whatever we can to keep our 
local one of kind restaurants alive uh, through un unbelievable year for restaurants. Um, I think they're hit harder than any other sector, maybe besides. Um, okay. Is this required in roll call? Fine. Uh, Councilmember Radner? Yes. Councilmember Whitehead? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Burns? Yes. Councilmember Edgar? Yes. Mayor McClellan? Yes, thank you. Uh, motion carried, and um, we're doing uh, a little bit to help our local restaurant. Okay, and then last, no, not last, I have two more. Um, 14D, uh, Director Jocelyn Davis, please. Thank you, City Manager Tom Gate, and good evening, Mayor McClellan, members of council, it's so good to see you. I have some wonderful news to share with you and share with our residents. We have a lot of great community um, events coming up. The first one I'd like to talk about is Ask the Attorney. We have this wonderful series and council member Whitehead uh, kicked us off in uh, February. And now March the 3rd, we will have Al Elvin, who is a current board member with the library and he's an attorney. So anyone interested in being part of that event needs to call the library to register in advance at 248. 691-7480. It's also on the library's webpage. Another one. What do you get? Um, what can you can ask them any questions? Asking questions. As, as a matter of fact, that's a good question. Um, there are details. People should call the library to ask details about how this goes on because there are different ways they may do it. They may put people into a private room um, and talk with them individually, or they may do it as a group. It'd be best if, if, uh, if people are interested to give a call to find out. And uh, we'll make sure we clarify it also on the Facebook page. Okay. The other great event that the library is hosting is a British history talk with Edward Bottomley. Edward Bottomley is a historian. He actually works with our uh, library board president, Gina Sawani. She was wonderful instrumental in getting him to come to Oak Park to do a talk. And he is from London, uh, London born. He spent a ch chunk of his childhood actually in Tokyo. And he now lives here in Milford with his wife and kids, but he spent a lot of time in the UK. He has a passion for history with a BA from the University of Kent at Canterbury and an MA from our own University of Detroit Mercy right here. And uh, he studies it now. Some of his topics are gonna to be interesting. He's going to talk about um, what it is to be British. So we're gonna talk about different accents, locations, culture and behavior, which will be really neat. He's gonna discuss things like um, the myths of Merlin, which are interesting. And he's gonna do something very interesting and talk about being black and British. Now, Mr. Bottomley himself is not black, but he has written a book. Uh, the book is called Black and British, A Forgotten History. Um, and he says his grim opening is from that book. When I was a child growing up on a council estate in the Northeast of England, I imbibed enough of the background racial tensions of the light, late 70s and 80s to feel profoundly unwelcome in Britain. It's gonna be very interesting. So if you're interested in being a part of that talk, please do give a call to the library at 248-691-7480 um, to get more information about the Zoom because it will be virtual. Another great thing that is happening through our recreation department is more sh um, shamrock shenanigans is another scavenger hunt. So we had great, great uh, participation in our scavenger hunt last month. And now we're having another one on March the 13th, which is a Saturday called Shamrock Shenanigans uh, Scavenger Hunt. Um, this is another one where we'll be looking for families to find the shamrocks. They'll be placed in some of our parks and in the windows of some of our businesses. And the first five families to find all of the shamrocks will be winners. The first place will win a family membership to the Henry Ford Museum and Village. Second through fifth place winners will win 2021 Oakland County Parks Family Fun Passes. So these, these gifts are really looking great. Uh, registration is required by Friday, March the 12th at 4 p.m. Uh, contact Mara Lee at 248-691-2357. And you'll also be able to find that on Facebook as well with the numbers there. Let me just go back for a moment. I hope I mentioned this, but when British History Talk by Edward Bottomley, that happens on March the 24th at 6.30 p.m. I'm sorry I didn't mention that before. And again, please call 248-691-7480 to learn more. 
Also, we have our senior drive-in bingo, which is a big hit with our seniors. And the next ones are on Monday, March the 8th and March the 22nd. They're at 11.30 a.m. in the morning for one hour in the recreation parking lot. You're able to play bingo right from your car with your own board inside of your car and listen through the radio. That's a big hit. We still have smart transportation for our age, uh, our residents ages 50 plus and anyone who needs help with ability. Um, the new hours for that are 8.30 to 4. You just call the art recreation office and they will be able to arrange where you need to go. It's not just going to the store, it's also going to doctor's appointments and other places as well. So that number is 248-691-7555. Uh, virtual trivia night is coming up. We can keep that going as well. That's very popular. It's $5 per night per team. You uh, use a Zoom to register. You register and get your Zoom information. And there are prizes, gift cards, and T-shirts. There will be four of them coming up in March. The first one is 90s to 2000s popular movies on March the 4th. There's, the next one is 90s hits, March the 11th. Star Wars trivia on March the 18th. And all things Disney on March 25th. The first three weeks start at seven o'clock. The last one on March 25th begins at 6.30. That one's more geared toward family. Um, also, we have a lot of sports. So I'm gonna be brief about this one and just tell you, we have wonderful Quad City Alliance Youth Co-Ed teams coming up. That is outdoors. I am looking for us to open up the outdoors again. Very exciting. Quad City Alliance Youth Teams are uh, an alliance we have with Ferndale, Hazel Park, and Pleasant Ridge in Oak Park. We're all part of a Quad City uh, League there. Uh, soccer is co-ed, and it begins April 10th through May 15th from 9 to 11. And it is hmm, registered by April the 2nd. Forget about that timing. Let's just say this. Give a call over to the office at 248-691-7555 if you're interested in Quad City Alliance Youth Co-ed Soccer. We go from, we have four different teams, a U4, a U6, a U8, and a U10, um, and that means ages three to nine. So give a call to find out more about that. The other one is Quad City Alliance Youth Co-Ed Baseball, also running at the same time. That registration is due by May the 1st, and we also have several teams that go all the way, way up from age five to age 14. So again, give a call to 248-691-7555 to learn more. Uh, a couple of more things here. Just a, uh, just a reminder that our wonderful partner, Forget Forgotten Harvest, continues to um, do their food di distribution, their pantry in the recreation parking lot every Wednesday between the hours of nine and noon. And I say noon, and that is until the supplies are gone. So if they're gone before noon, it's before noon. But they'll be there unless there's harsh weather. Um, what you should always do if there's been a snowfall is check the website, look at the recreation page, or call the recreation office to find out if a Forgotten Harvest will indeed have their uh, food pantries, but it's every Wednesday from nine to noon. Another reminder is we are closed now, uh, according to city, man uh, um, to city Council's good judgment, we are closed now to the public until April the 14th, but we are all still working. I'm gonna remind you as I do every week, we are all still working uh, behind the scenes, some of us from home, others were staggering in the office so that we're safe. So you can still get your business taken care of by the city of Oak Park. You can make your payments uh, through the Dropbox, also online. And just a reminder, if you are using a direct link to your bank account, Oak Park does not charge a fee when you make payments online. So that's something to remember. And we're there for you. Maybe you can call us. You can email us. You check the uh, website for those kinds of contact uh, information. And then finally, snow removal, another one. I'm hoping that we won't have to deal with this too much longer. I don't know what the groundhog saw, but it looks beautiful out there these past few days. But when we do call a snow emergency, just remember that it'll, it's called for the length of time is usually there. It will be there on the posting. You'll see the snow emergency closings on our website, on the homepage. You'll also see it on Facebook posts. If there's a very serious uh, emergency, we also uh, are in touch with um, NBC, ABC, CBS, and Fox 2. And we use WWJ and WJR radio. Um, but you can look at also our Comcast page, OPTV15 and 16, again, Facebook page and our website. And do sign up, please, for our robocalls, robotexts. You can do robocalls from your cell phone or your landline. And uh, it's not just about snow emergencies. It's about, any, about anything that we need you to know. This is how you find out about closures, 
um, snow emergencies, and the like. So look at the main page of the website. Look for a little box on the right-hand side that says stay informed, and please sign up there if you'd like to receive information from us. I believe that's all I have. Um, uh, that is all I have. We've got an exciting month coming up. Thank you so much, uh, City Council, um, Mayor McClellan, and City Manager Tom Gates. Thank you, Director Davis. Um, 14E, I believe our City Attorney, Courtney Kraus, is going to take that one. Good evening, Madam Mayor and City Council. The agreement that is before you tonight as matter number 14E is the proposed purchase agreement to be signed by City Manager Tungit for the sale of Jackson Park to the Ferndale Public Schools for the construction of a new elementary school. This was previously before council in 2019. We've been actively negotiating the terms of the agreement. Um, at the present time, the school district is committed to work with the city and nearby residents in the site plan, plan development, specifically for recreational space that will be shared with the public for the school. Um, we do not have the ability to require formal site plan approval because that is um, exempt for public schools and the state is the one that has the authority to um, approve that. The purchase agreement um, is in its final form before you tonight. It remains subject to the school district finalizing um, approvals from nearby residents to remove the deed restrictions that are currently in place on the property. The property currently is restricted to use as um, residential only. In order to have those restrictions removed, the school district has to obtain the approval of more than 50% of the residents in the plat where the park is located. I'm happy to answer any questions that council may have at this time regarding the agreement. Uh, have they uh, attempted to get these OKs from the residents? They are in the process of doing so right now. It's my understanding they've had a town hall to provide residents with some information regarding the construction of the school site. And they will be sending out ballots shortly to all of the residents in the plat to have them approve um, the proposed removal of the deed restrictions. Couldn't they have done that like a long time ago? <laughs> Um, I mean, given that we're, we already have a purchase agreement and residents have not been fully, they haven't voted on this yet. I mean, I know I've been seeing more comments about this project um, just on social media and it sort of surprised me because this has been in the works for a long time. Is it a little premature for us to be considering a purchase agreement at this moment? Basically. The purchase agreement is subject to those deed restrictions being removed. So if for some reason they are not successful in getting the required number of resident signatures, the agreement would become null and void. So they haven't hired an architect yet, just yet. Yes, they have um, handled, hired an architect and an engineer, um, but the ultimate decision on the site plan and what they decide to do is dependent on whether they can acquire this additional acreage from the city. Any um, questions? Um, before the, maybe before the questions, why don't we get a motion to approve, uh, for a resolution approving the purchase agreement for the sale of Jackson Park uh, subject to uh, the conditions that were mentioned. So moved. Okay, that's Burns and second. Seconded. Thank you, Edgar, thank you. Um, discussion, further discussion? Uh, roll call then. Council Member Radner. Yes. Council Member Whitehead. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Burns. Yes. Council Member Edgar. Yes. Mayor McClellan. Yes. Uh, a new school would be a fabulous thing for Oak Park. The, uh, the recreation op opportunities sound to me. Um, and uh, our recreation director is pleased with um, the negotiations. So uh, I'm, I'm all for it. I think it would be just a, a benefit to that whole area to have a new school there. Um, okay, Madam Mayor, members of council, that completes the city manager report for this evening. Thank you very much.
Thank you for the manager meeting. And we are now on call to the audience. Uh, Director Crystal Van Bleck will handle that if anybody uh, has anything that they would like to say. There's a three minute limit. Um, Yep, if you would like to speak for public comment, you can use the raise your hand function, which if you can't find it on your screen, if you click participants, it'll show up. Um, or you can also um, use the chat box and we can call on you. <laughs> that was a vote for the dog park. I don't see anyone. I think uh, Kenneth Sherman's uh, new dog, Prince, is a yes vote for the uh, <laughs> for the dog park. There is, um, in the chat from Kenneth Sherman, Prince thanks one and all for the warm welcome to Oak Park. <laughs> he was um, one of the dogs of Oak Park on my favorite uh, Facebook posts stolen directly from Julie Edgar. Mayor, it does not look like anyone um, has risen their hand to participate in public comment. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I was going to put in a plug for uh, helping with the donation um, to, uh, to help us turn Oak Park um, from a pretty downtrodden down in the mouth looking spot to what would be just the center of the city. It would be a gem. So I'm hoping I'm I'm warming up my checkbook right now and hope you will too. Um, uh, there was a Washington DC study where black residents make up 46% of the city, but are three fourths of those who died of coronavirus. Um, Dr. Uh, Mayor Muriel Bowser declared Wednesday a day of remembrance for these 1,000 beautiful souls who passed. Uh, she talked about lost parents, children, cousins, neighbors, classmates, colleagues, friends, and our cherished loved ones. And in the toll, uh, her only sister, Mercia, uh, was included. Um, she joins the legion of angels who have gone home too soon due to the pandemic. Um, and just to let you know that we are at the one year anniversary of the first case in Michigan, which was March 10th, 2020. Um, there, there is good news coming about that as um, Mayor uh, City Manager Tungate uh, hinted, uh, we can't make it public yet, but some good news finally is coming. Um, some people are frustrated trying to get online and get a, a vaccine using the computer. My friend this morning is a long-term li librarian who tried getting on um, one of the drugstores, CDC, I think, and she said it was such a confusing website, she had a hard time finding the little button to press. And I thought if she's having trouble, a lot of us are having trouble. So if you are overwhelmed, uh, help is available. Uh, as our um, city commissioner Cavell mentioned, please take out your pencil right now and write down the number for nurse on call. The nurse on call, uh, and let them know that you are, do not have internet access and that this has to be handled by phone. So here is the number, 1-800-484-5533. I was walking around getting my 100 signatures to run for mayor and a, a dear neighbor on my block uh, hasn't been able to uh, do that. So I gave him a card with that number on it and told him to please uh, get in the Save My Spot line by calling 1-800-484-5533.
Um, we have um, worn masks, social distanced for an entire year. And uh, now we can see a light at the end of the tunnel and uh, we can keep on keeping on. Um, there is a bond renewal that we'll hear about at the next meeting. <clears throat> Sorry, for Oak Park schools. All schools have taken a hit because of COVID pandemic and their expenses are way up, but their revenues are not. But this is not a tax increase. It is a renewal. Please let everyone know to support our schools. <clears throat> um, a little bit about forgotten harvest. It was August, 2020, when a lot of food pantries closed because of the pandemic and our own Oak Park Forgotten Harvest stepped up its game. And they have a zero contact way to pass out food every Wednesday from nine to 12. And it's a drive-through model where volunteers put boxes of foods into, into people's trunks. And they serve 700 families a week. <clears throat> if you are interested in volunteering, uh, get your pencil out again and visit ForgottenHarvest.org slash volunteer and see page three for details on volunteering during a pandemic. Um, also, kudos that I just found out about back at the, the, the December holidays. I didn't know, but Forgotten Harvest partnered with Kroger and delivered 6,000 beautiful holiday meals um, to the one in six Metro Detroiters who are facing food insecurity. Um, Rachel Hurst, Corporate Affairs Manager of Kroger said, we're proud to join forces with Forgotten Harvest and provide healthy food options to our communities in need. This is a great event that shows the true meaning of the holidays, which is to give. So mayoral hugs to Kroger and Forgotten Harvest and to you if you're uh, one of the volunteers that's helping. Um, we are next, Mayor Pro Tem Burns, if you would like to uh, say something for a call to the council. Thank you to the audience members and thank you for all of the hard work done by our departments, our recreation department, our uh, public services department, and for uh, Ms. Jocelyn Davis and her group. You guys are doing an excellent job. Kimberly Maroney, as always, you're on top of it. And to the public, please be safe. Thank you and good night. Council Member Edgar. Uh, good evening. Uh, congratulations to the people who are going to be serving on our, our boards and commissions. Um, I was really impressed with everybody who stepped up and um, I hope it's the beginning of a, a long-term engagement with the city. Um, also wanted to uh, that Ken Sherman over here in, I can't I don't know which Brady Bunch box he's in, but he's got his new pooch. That's Prince. And um, Ken rehomed this dog, which is a, a Shih Tzu Yorkie mix. He, um, it was nextdoor.com, of course. That's where everything comes from these days. He was able to take somebody's dog who could no longer care for him. Um, we're going to bring up a little picture here. Crystal's helping out. Uh, Isn't he cute? So Ken Sherman has a new best friend. Congratulations, Ken. And um, uh, I lastly, I, I know that Ken uh, is a social worker by profession. I think retired, but it is uh, March is National Social Work Month. And I know just from where I work, which is uh, the Area Agency on Aging 1B, I know how very critical social workers are. They really keep things together. I mean, they help in so many different ways. Um, so to all the social workers out there, thank you for what you do. Uh, it's really important. Um, and uh, 
the, I, I thought the nine mile redesign uh, presentation that was great. It just looks wonderful. Uh, one of the people who was interviewed, I think a businessman, maybe a realtor, was talking about the importance of the linear park to young families. And, and I would agree wholeheartedly. I also just think that a, um, a new community center would also benefit the uh, residents of our city, young and old. It's just a thought, um, just, just to sort of get some conversation going. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, thank you. Good night. Mm -hmm. um, Council member Radner, I don't know if you've got a dog story. Well, I can't follow that. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> Good night. Council member Whitehead. Thank you. Uh, I'll just be brief. Um, I attended the Michigan Municipal League um, Core Weekender this weekend, and um, thanks a lot to uh, Miss Wright, who was I see on the call, who helped set that up along with Director Van Fleck. That was uh, an awesome weekend. Um, it was a two-day event. Um, was able to get uh, eleven. Um, so far, I have eleven credits on the first level of twenty-five credits. So in the first two months, uh, we are doing pretty good. I'm about halfway there to get to the first level. Because uh, they do have a different four stage um, criteria for um, the elected officials municipal league. Um, so I um, got three credits earlier last month for the newly elected official seminar. So it's really good uh, information. Three of the things that we talked about um, that stood out to me, at least, that I wanted to bring back to everyone. Um, they talked about leadership responsibilities, uh, millages, and zoning opportunities. So uh, very informative, great weekend. Um, wanted to touch base on that. Also really excited echoing um, council member Edgar about the new nine board and commission members we have there. That's an awesome um, core of people that we're bringing in. Um, so talented. So about our ad hoc committee for uh, the Juneteenth celebration, as well as um, the linear part. Um, it was a great presentation, Director Stasiak and Director Maroney and Director Van Fleck. So that park is going to, I'll echo the mayor, the park is going to really make the city vibrant. Um, and with that, everybody should have a good night. Good night. Be well. No further business to come before the council. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you for coming. Hmm.